Hello everyone, you may have seen somewhere else that with simple configuration like this Spring Boot Starter or up to client dependency and providing the client ID and client secret of Google or GitHub in the application of YAML which already enabled or up to login in Spring Boot is extremely easy. But of course, it's not enough if we want to turn our application with more complex use cases we have to encounter in real life. So knowing what was running behind the scenes is never a bad idea. Alright, follow the Spring documentation. The OAuth 2 logging is implemented by using authorization code grant. What's that? So, basically, the grant here is a flow of sequential steps to get an access token. We have to follow this step here, and at the end, we'll receive a token granted us a privileges to access a user resource, not our resource, because we are talking from the application creator point of view we are on behalf of the user getting his resource. Sometimes we also hear authorization code flow, they are the same. Besides authorization code flow, all up to an open ID connect defines many other flows like implicit flow, password flow, client credential flow, device flow, CIBA flow, and especially an update of authorization code flow is the authorization code flow with Pixie. Implicit flow and password flow are deprecated in OAuth 2.1, but you might have seen them in some old projects. If you're interested in them, you can find them in the description below. I'll put them here. In today's video, we'll take a look at the authorization code brand and see how Spring uses it to make all of the login features from the high level. Look at the diagram. There are some terms here describe some main factors that we want to get familiar. First, resource owner, the owner of the resource. Follow that, of course, we have the resource, right? User agents. Let's ignore it at the moment. Usually, it's a web browser. It doesn't contribute much to our semantic context. A client. Act on behalf of the resource owner, do the thing that the resource owner wants. The authorization server validates the resource owner's coordinates between resource owner and the client to grant the proper privileges to client to access the resource owner's resources. And another thing you know should be around here, the protector of the resource, resource server. So at the last step here, step E client get the asset token and a step F for example if we have it should be using that token to get the resource from the resource server. Okay let's simplify the flow to make it more natural to understand. Let's say we have an apartment in our area. Each resident of the apartment has his or her old bicycle in its parking lot. So if we map to all of two terminologies the resident here is is the resource owner and his bicycle is the resource. Next, not anybody can go to the parking lot to take the bicycle. We have the security here to protect residents' bicycles and he is, you guess, a resource server. So in order to take the bicycle, we'll need an allowance from the apartment manager. So if someone wants to take the bicycle, they have to get the ticket from the apartment manager and bring it to the security guard and he will let you take the bicycle. So the apartment manager here is obviously the authorization server. On our side, we want to provide our business to residents of this apartment that bring their bicycle to their place. For example, if they're in a school and want to get their bicycle from the apartment parking slot. So our service is go to the security guys asking him to take the bicycle from the parking lot and bring it to them. Let's call it bicycle delivery service. And apparently it's a client. The flow should start when a resident calls the service to bring his bicycle to the school where he is. Hey, can you have bring in my bicycle here? So from the bicycle delivery service, since I cannot go directly to the parking slot to ask the security guys for your bike, I need a parking slot ticket from your apartment manager. Can you have me request for that ticket? I'll redirect your call to your apartment managers. 
So now the resident is redirected to the apartment managers. Hello, I'd like to let the bicycle delivery service take my bicycle from the parking lot. Can you give him a ticket so he can present it to the security guys? So the apartment managers will, yeah, no problem. But first of all, we need to know who you are. Can you tell me your name, your room number, a, a photo of your ID card, etc. So this is actually the authentication step, right? A login page. Here you need to provide your username and password, for example, and two-factor authentication, for example, if they require it. Then next, here is my name, and here's my room, and here's my ID photo, for example. And then the apartment manager authenticated successfully. Then he will reply here, for example, hello, I recognize you. So you agree that you grant bicycle delivery service the privileges to get your bicycle, don't you? So this is the consent page that the apartment managers want to make sure that yeah the that the resident really understand their actions. Okay, I agree. So I understand that I'm going to give the privilege to get the bicycle. Okay, that's good. Here's a temporary code ABC. Give it to the bicycle delivery service and tell them send it to me right away so I can know for sure that they are on behalf of you and not somebody else requesting for a ticket. The cost will expire very soon and the apartment manager also redirect you back to the bicycle delivery service. So here, now the resident is talking to the bicycle delivery service. I'm back. Here is my temporary card from apartment managers. You can now call him and exchange the card to get the ticket. So the bicycle delivery service now have the card and he's going to exchange it to the ticket. Hello apartment managers, I'd like to get the ticket for that card. And because the apartment managers is the one who issued the card, so they know that, okay, this card is valid. And this card is for the resident X, then they return with a ticket. Here's your ticket. And with it, you can get the bicycle of your requested user. Okay, so after having the ticket, it's actually the asset token, right? Then the bicycle delivery service will contact the resource server. Nice day, guy. I'd like to get the bicycle of this ticket. And the resource server, yeah, have a ticket, then send back the bicycle for the bicycle delivery service. And with this bicycle, the bicycle delivery service can, yeah, you know, bring it to the school of the resident. So, if we are mapping to the all of two terms, the temporary court here is actually the authorization court. The ticket is of course the asset token. The fold here is a user agent helping us to redirect the resource owner between the client and the authorization server. So it's exactly the web browsers in our web application. Client, they just get the code from the resource owner and get the asset token from the authorization server and by using that asset token they can request for a resource without knowing who is the user so only the authorization server know who is the user and maybe the resource server know who is user by you know they validate the asset token with the authorization server to make sure you know, this asset token is valid and issued by the authorization server properly so from the client side, you know, the bicycle delivery service, they may don't need to know who's the user is. So that's why we said the OAuth 2 is the industry standard protocol for authorization, not the authentication. But we can take advantage of this authorization code load for authentication as well by using the OpenID Connect to get the ID token that contains the resource owner information like we did in our OAuth 2 login with Google or by calling user info URI like in our or up to login with GitHub. We'll talk about them in later videos. Now so let's confirm the authorization code flow running behind the or up to login feature offering. Okay, let's back to application. Run it. Okay, it's up and running. We will need to put a breakpoint because we are going to demo with Google. We put a breakpoint here in the default authorization code token response client. Let's put a breakpoint here. Okay. Now let's go to localhost ATATs, inspect element, and network. And we'll stick at the reserve lock. Okay, let's choose Google this time. So by choosing Google, it means 
as a resource owner of my information in Google, I like to log in into this string or up to login application. And this application can get my user information at Google. So and in order to get the resource owner information, the OAuth 2 Spring client is redirected to the authorization server. Here is the Google Identity Provider, right? So we have to notice the domain here. Maybe some fake application may redirect you to the wrong authorization server. And by typing your username and password in the wrong authorization server, you uh, are you know, like revealed your username and password to another, you know, like to the hacker or something, and then they can steal your account, for example. So be aware with the redirect URI here, the redirect domain here. So make sure that it's exactly like Google in this case. Okay, here is the login page. Users will authenticate here, and now let's Logging. You know, after logging successfully, the authorization server, here is the Google Identity Server, will ask you for an agreement from a consent page. So this is the consent page that makes sure you really want to share your role, or maybe that they will have some, you know, like some box for you to tick the role that you want to rent the client app. For example, here, do the resource owners really want to share uh, their name, their email, their address to the string boot or up to client, for example. And by clicking continue like a read, so you a read that use the privilege you rent here to get your resource in the resource server. Okay, continue. continue. So, now you see that after a read and Google will redirect you back to the application, to the Spring Boot application. Here you see, so it's going to redirect you to the local host is where our application is, ATAT, right? And with the code here. So with the code. So it's a temporary code and if you remembered once we have the temporary code and we redirect it to the to our client, so our client is going to exchange like here this code right, going to exchange the code to get the access token. Okay, so that's why you see now we in a client right. Then we have the code here and we are going to exchange the code to get the client. So this is our request. So this is the request that we're going to send to the authorization server, to Google. So here in the body of request, you see we have the code. So this is exactly the code here, you know, 27.8 request. 27.8. So we are going to exchange this code to get the set token. Okay, then let's run it and then we have the token response hmm? token response so we have now the access token so this is our set token so when the client receives an asset token it's also the end of the authorization code flow for getting the resource owner information to logging the authorization code flow itself is sometimes not enough like we mentioned earlier we need open id connect or the user info URI, but let's give it sort for this recipe. We'll dive down to them with Google and GitHub completed configuration in later videos. Okay, let's move forward, and then we're going to have the response. All right, that pretty much just for this video. I hope you got something new out of it. Thank you so much for taking your time watching this recipe and this series. And as always, see you next time. Happy coding.